the every culture in various forms. If you want to prevent war, prepare for it. That's right. Um, do you think we understand that well enough in Australia or are we somehow assuming that we're nice people in the world, we'll just go on behaving as though we should be left to our own devices? Well, I think that uh, what you've said is absolutely right. I think in Australia we've been so, as a nation, and I know there are pockets of great poverty and so on, but as a nation we've become extremely wealthy and as such we're now 25 million people. When we were four and a half to five million, we took care of our defence. Now we're 25 million. We seem to think that we're all okay, that nobody, our distances are fine and there couldn't be a war and the trade will all solve all the issues and all these sorts of things. And uh, we haven't taken responsibility for our own defence. We're 25 million people among the wealthiest little countries in the world. We are surrounded by a large moat, but we've got to make sure that that moat, the island structures are all in our general area, that we help, we become great friends to, and that we can defend our own neck of the woods. And this requires fundamentally naval and air power, but it also requires a strong and mobile and highly effective army. And that's the ADF as a whole. But we have to wake up while there's still time. Uh, as you say, we are quite a wealthy country, but here's something that staggers people when I say it to them. Russia is seen as a global power. People are concerned about what Russia might do. They're aware that it's very powerful. The Australian economy is the same size as Russia's. No one sees us as a threat, and we don't want to be a threat. We simply want to be seen as people who will stand up for our values and play a constructive role if someone needs to enforce the peace. But it's an interesting point, isn't it, that uh, uh, we sometimes hear people say, oh, no, no, if anything nasty happens, we're not big enough to make a difference. When we were four and a half million people, we were able to build a second tier navy and be massively instrumental in the outcome of the First World War on the battlefields. We celebrate that every year. Even in the Second War, when we finally got our act together, we played a critical role in a couple of the major battles of the Second World War. Now, there seems no excuse for us. In an age when we can't assume that the superpower of the day, once it was Britain, now it's America, will be fully able to support us if something goes wrong, surely we ought to be able to step up and recognise our size, our wealth, and the desirability of standing for the freedoms that we think matter. I think that is absolutely correct. And as you mentioned earlier, uh, in, in slightly different words, the greatest welfare for our nation, the central welfare, is the security of the people externally as well as internally. We have turned very much internally, and that's fully understandable with some of our people wanting to throw bombs and all this sort of thing. But externally, we have rather lost the plot. Not entirely, but uh, we need to really look at our position in the world, and we really must consider it's all a question of priorities. You mentioned Russia, and Russia's priority is to build vast armed forces and, and make sure that the country can uh, uh, do what it wants, really, I suppose. Uh, but in our case, we have uh, organised our priorities so that while we look after one side of welfare of the people, in, in terms of the world standards, uh, very highly. Uh, but in the other side, which is the security of the nation, that side of our welfare, we have neglected. To be fair, there has been good progress made in recent years. The, the Navy is undergoing a significant rebuilding. Um, we've got the you know, Air Force being re-equipped. Some things, good things are happening in the Army. 
Uh, and of course, you've seen a good bipartisan cooperation on foreign interference in Australian politics, academia, media, yes. and so forth. Those things are to be welcomed. But it strikes me that there are two areas which stand out as beacons of our complacency. You mentioned it took, what, four or five years to get a second tier Navy from a, a moment of decision to having it here sailing through the heads before the first war. You talked about the extraordinary way in the Cold War in which over a five year period we invested in new ships out of America, new submarines, taught our people how to operate submarines. We do not have in Australia today, after many years of it being obvious it was going to be a problem, the strategic fuel reserves we need to keep the country, the economy and the defence forces going if something goes wrong. That's one area of complacency that I find, frankly, deeply disturbing. And the second area is one that I think you will have some strong views on as a former uh, naval man. Ten years ago it was agreed with some urgency that we needed a new modern submarine fleet 10 years ago. And we're still at the point of being uncertain, as I speak now, as to the sign-off on those. The earliest any of them might arrive would be the mid-30s, still a long way away ago, leaving an uh, from here, uh, leaving an enormous gap in the meantime. Why are we not able to move faster as a nation when we recognise on a bipartisan basis, I think it was widely recognised, way back 10 years ago, that we needed to move, that in fact, uh, and to put some numbers around it, that the Chinese would have around 70 submarines uh, in the water by 2020. My understanding is that they got there well ahead of that date. We still haven't finished ordering and designing ours. Well, I think that what you're saying is, is something that the uh, nation must really closely look at. Uh, perhaps uh, one should consider that we're building, we used to have a policy where we built in Australia whatever we could in our Navy. So we built frigates and of course we bought the first of the American uh, guided missile uh, uh, frigates from overseas, they were built in Bay City in America, then we started building them here. And that was a very sensible policy. We got organised and then we followed on from what we'd bought overseas. And if you look at the submarine question, we seem to have decided that we will go straight to building and designing our own submarine. Well, we certainly have the reason to to, um, for the requirements of what a submarine in Australia must, uh, must be able to do. But one of the great things is, of course, the speed of deployment undetected in a submarine. And this is very important to governments and to democratic governments in particular, and governments of an island nation like us, because we have vast distances. So the speed of deployment undetected, or you hope undetected, is exceedingly important. We seem to have uh, decided that we can't uh, look at the question of uh, nuclear propulsion. Well, nuclear propulsion, I think a lot of people think it's a little bang going on all the time, which might make a big bang in a submarine. I first uh, did uh, trials with a British nuclear-powered submarine, went to sea in it, 51 years ago. 51 years ago. As far as I'm aware, there's never been any question of a nuclear problem in a, of any dimension in any British, American or French submarine. And they've had them for 50, 60 years. Now, we, for some of us, believe that we must not send our young men and our young women to sea deep in the oceans in a very dangerous environment in anything but the most efficient, effective and survivable boat there is. And that to some of us would mean that we should be going nuclear with its fast deployment, 
with his capabilities which are so much greater than any uh, conventional submarine. It can chase targets and overtake them because of its speed. It can be deployed quickly. It can get out of the way quickly. And indeed, it doesn't have to put anything above the sea. Anything you put above the sea now can be detected. And uh, you may have satellites that tell you something. You're within a couple of feet, of, a couple of uh, meters or something. And uh, Australia must not drift back in technology compared with other countries in the world. We must look to the future and we must look and say, not it's too difficult, but how can we do it? Uh, when we were going into submarines, there were people who said, oh, this would be too difficult. We haven't been in submarines for 20, 30 years. It would be impossible. Well, the answer was you get people who can say, we're going to do it. How do we do it? And I think this is what needs to be done right now and it needs to be explained to the people. And I'm sure if they thought about it, to send our young men and women to sea, they should be in the best possible environment. You're saying very clearly that the survivability, if something goes wrong, the safety of young men and women seeking to defend the country uh, is better secured in nuclear propelled uh, submarines than in conventionals? Yes. I'm not a submariner, and I'm in there are certain circumstances where a conventionally powered submarine uh, is, is maybe arguably slightly better than a nuclear. But overall, the nuclear powered submarines are far better in, in just in so many, many ways. Um, and that's the situation. That is why China is going nuclear in its propulsion, why India has gone nuclear in its propulsion. It's why Britain and America stopped building conventional submarines many decades ago. This is the situation. The French continued, not least for foreign sales, and the Germans, of course, produce conventional, and the Japanese. The Japanese haven't got the same problem that we've got of distance, of distance. To those who would say uh, then that um, there are a lot of shallow waters to the north of Australia and that diesels can sit quietly in the weeds, so to speak, uh, in those situations where nuclears can't and remain undetected. Do you have a response to that? I have a response to that. If you go in shallow water in any submarine, and remember the uh, conventional submarines now and the ones we're building, they're smaller than the nuclears, but not all that amount smaller. If you go into shallow waters, like the Arafura Sea or somewhere, you give away one of your three great advantages because you no longer have the advantage of your third dimension, which is depth. So instead of being able to go down to a thousand of the 300 meters or something, you can't. There ain't no water under there. So you're stuck with going left, right, and that's it. You can't use your other tremendously great advantage of using the depths. And, and to those who would say, well, by the time we get these submarines, they'll be obsolete technology because if you could take them out with new technologies, they'll be irrelevant. Is the traditional argument that uh, effective submarines are an incredibly powerful and important deterrent for an island nation like Australia becoming redundant, in your view? No, I don't think so. I think it's, uh, I think it's almost the reverse. The, uh, a properly equipped with the right weapons systems submarine, and if you look, if you remember the, uh, let's take the Iraq war. Uh, our TV showed uh, missiles, Tomahawk missiles fired from destroyers or submarines, submarines fired from perhaps a thousand kilometers away. I don't know, some distance. I'm not privy to the secrets of these things any longer. Uh, going through the windows of the headquarters of the Iraqi army in Baghdad. The submarines, because you've got to detect them, well, there are lots of detection devices today and it's 
much better than it used to be in many ways, but they're still hard to find, particularly if they can move as a nuclear-powered submarine might do, or 700 miles or more in a day. You're, you've got a big problem on your hands of dealing with them. And of course this means that you can, in fact, a nuclear-powered submarine can stay at sea if the engines keep going for as long as the crew can last, because you don't have to refuel them. And in our, you mentioned this question of fuel security, I agree entirely we should be looking extremely carefully at our, our fuel reserves in this nation. We not only uh, have let them run down and close some of our oil refineries, we're not nearly in a position as good as we were in World War II. From what the press says, uh, this seems to be so. And, but there are many other aspects. We no longer have a merchant marine of any size, or half a dozen ships or something. And we would depend on everybody else's ships to bring the oil into Australia. And of course, shipping would be one of the first things which everybody would attack for the very reasons I said earlier on. And then the owners of those ships would say, well, we're not going to Australia, or we're not carting their oil in, or we're not bringing their armaments in. We can't get insurance if, if something went wrong. All these things could happen. No doubt that people have worked out what might be a solution, but if you lose control of the oceans around you, you're finished. Because we depend so much. If we, let's forget trade. Just think of the, import, of, of the imports that we have to bring in. Yes, aircraft can bring a lot of things in. They have to be refueled probably when they get here. That's one question. Uh, they can bring a lot in, but not the big heavy stuff that we would need if we have to defend the country. Oh, and the sheer quantities of oil we'd need just to keep our domestic yep, economy absolutely. going. absolutely. People overlook that. They really do. Uh, we've got dangerously close in recent years to running out of diesel. Diesel's the fuel that keeps everything going. Our trains moving for you know, heavy freight, for moving groceries around, our trucks taking medical supplies to outback towns, let alone the groceries. It's actually, in my view, quite a serious issue and I can't believe it's not being taken more seriously. Well, there are a lot of things that sinews of the defence of the nation which one would hope that were being examined very closely. We need to look at all the sinews very closely. I think we're starting to. I think we're starting to realise the importance of our own infrastructure being in Australian hands or subject to very, very strong Australian control and uh, I think we're starting with all this, and it is great. We've got to speed the whole thing up because uh, we must not find ourselves in a situation where decisions are being made in capital cities elsewhere in the world which affect our ability to defend ourselves. Well, Andrew, thank you very much for this. I think, I hope that people will recognise the enormous benefit of understanding history in general and our own in particular. When we have been awake and prepared, we've been in a better position all the way through. Nothing changes that, surely. And at a time when I feel we're too focused on tearing one another apart over all sorts of issues that in the end uh, just see us arguing with ourselves rather than focusing on the things that should unite us. And we do face a very uncertain economic and strategic global outcome. The lessons of history are that it may not repeat itself exactly, but it always rhymes, and we should be awake. Well, as we draw this to a close, there are two issues I'd like to round off with, which I think they're very, very important. There are many people who say Australia should have a more independent foreign policy. Uh, my personal view would be that we may have to be capable of running a more independent foreign policy at some point in the future, but that it can't happen if you don't look like you actually mean it and have the capability to apply some teeth. I think that is absolutely right. I'd go further than that. And I'd say that uh, you must present to the world that in fact you're a tough nut to crack. You may have great resources and things that people rather like, but if you're a tough nut to crack, with strong defence forces, 
you are in a much position, greater position, position to preserve peace. And of course this goes back to the teaching of history. And the teaching of history in, should start in our schools with some of these very great strategic questions of the survival of a, a, an island continent which has a great advantage of distance, but it's got to use it. And it's got to, it's got to be, and it goes well beyond, of course, schools. We need the leadership of the nation to be telling the people what they've got to become as a nation of 25 million now, which might be 50 millions in a few decades' time, that can look after itself and is a tough nut to crack on, and it's going to defend its democracy and it's going to defend its culture. Well, that was the other point I was going to raise. You've just touched on it. It's really important that we understand history. And the value of this conversation, I think, uh, uh, is, uh, is, is in many ways bound up with the extraordinary perspective you have over a very long time of involvement with defence forces. But surely that lesson of history is that whilst it may never repeat exactly, it always rhymes. What's happened in the past is always provides a valuable classroom for the future. I do worry that we don't teach history comprehensively uh, and in a coordinated way, and that it's often, to be blunt about this, ideologically driven. Facts are facts, military facts, particularly of military facts. Military people spend a lot of time, as do economists, by the way, studying history so that they can avoid the mistakes of the past. Surely it's time we tried to make certain that our children, who are plainly interested and get the general drift of how important that is, you see that every Anzac Day service, to make sure that they actually do know what happened, what prices were paid for our freedoms, and how we can avoid having them threatened readily in the future. I think uh, this is uh, correct. One of the, one of the uh, aspects of this, of course, is our migration program. Now, in World War I and World War II, we were both uh, basically, we had all our arguments and all the problems that go on in democracies, but we were ba basically very cohesive nations. And when the bells rang and then people said, get in the army, start, get in the navy, get in the air force, get going, we did exactly that. And we have to teach our young and particularly our immigrants, many of whom come from countries without a maritime history as we know it, the, the sinews of Australia's defence, the sinews of our history that we pass on to our children. And we must uh, concentrate to a huge degree on the cohesion of the nation, speaking English well, really prepared to defend our democracy and our culture. And if we get away from that, then you find, may find that Australia becomes indefensible. Well, of course, very many of those immigrants have come here looking for freedom, and they'll tell you so. And they will often say, I, I have this happen a great deal. We wish Australia was a bit more alert. We came here looking for freedom. We've found it. We don't want to lose it. Thank you very much. Thank you.